Our speaker this evening is a priest of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Chicago. Father David Anderson studied under Father Alexander Schmemann at St. Vladimir's Seminary and was ordained in 1983. In addition to serving as a parish priest for 39 years, he has been both a teacher and a translator of patristic and Byzantine liturgical texts. He has presented many classes on liturgy and the church fathers throughout the country. He is presently the Byzantine Rite Chaplain at Wyoming Catholic College, and he also teaches for our Magdala Apostolate. Please join me in welcoming back to the Institute of Catholic Culture, Father David Anderson. Thank you, and it's a joy to be back, as always. And, and let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, O comforter, the Spirit of truth, who art everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of all blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Father Anthony the Great, pray to God for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It is to Egypt that we are going tonight. As we, as we speak of the catechetical school of Alexandria. Now, this city of Alexandria, of course, it's not difficult to see where the name comes from. The name comes from the great Greek conqueror, Alexander the Great, as he's called, great in terms of worldly power, on the one hand. On the other hand, perhaps a good consideration to begin, even though this great city becomes the, in 300 years after Alexander the Great founded it and named it in honor of himself, it becomes one of the greatest centers of Christianity. It's the second greatest city in the Roman Empire because by the time the first century AD has arrived, uh, Egypt is part of the Roman Empire. So when Alexandria was founded, the Greeks ruled Egypt. But by the time three centuries had passed, uh, Egypt had become part of the Roman Empire. So this city named by this man who lived only, in, and here I, I'm deliberately establishing a parallel, a comparison, uh, who lived to about the same age as our Lord Jesus Christ when he was crucified. And in those three decades that he lived, managed to conquer most of the then known world in, in Eurasia and Africa, that is to say. So all of the Mediterranean world, pretty much, North Africa, the Middle East, all the way to the boundaries of India. All that comprised Alexander's empire. And he did all that by the time he reached 30 years of age, chronologically. How different is the Son of God made man? The Son of God made man was known to practically nobody for more than 90% of his chronological life, you know. We often don't consider that. That when our Lord went to be baptized by John in the Jordan, and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon him in his humanity, the same Holy Spirit who dwelt eternally with the Son in his divinity, that same Holy Spirit as the scripture says, drove our Lord Jesus into the wilderness to be tested, to be sifted by the evil one. By the way, uh, and some of you I know have heard me say this before, uh, there's some controversy that's been going on for a few years now uh, about how we should say the Our Father, the last part of the Our Father. 
lead us not into temptation. Some people don't like that. They say it's confusing. They say that God doesn't tempt people to evil. That's true, by the way. He doesn't. Scripture says that God tempts no one to evil. But does God lead people to be tested? Yes. Yes. And this testing is a severe testing. Our Lord said to Peter, James, and John, as they entered the Garden of Gethsemane the night before the Passion, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. We're not talking about uh, temptation for to this or that sin. It's the temptation of whether or not, in the most basic sense, one is going to content, continue to obey and seek and do the will of God. So in that sense, yes, we are led into temptation. We ask, we ask that we, we may be spared the pain of that. Jesus asked to be spared the pain of it. Father, if you are willing, let this chalice pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. So to be to be to pray in the in the our Father to not be led into temptation is to pray to be delivered from that giving up of faith and trust in God. So anyway, Jesus, our Lord, had lived a large portion of his life by the time he publicly manifested himself at his baptism. In contrast to the great conqueror, Alexander the Great. Well, city of Alexandria, the intellectual center, as I said, of the Roman Empire in the first century AD. Some, some of you who know some history might say, well, isn't that Athens? Isn't that the great center of philosophy, the great philosophical schools in Athens, where Socrates and Plato and Aristotle taught. And that had been the case, it's true. But by the time of the first century Christian era, uh, Alexandria had taken the place of, of Athens in many ways. So the great schools and libraries that are found there, for example, um, give you a, a little a little background here in the city of alexandria and this is long before christianity came there uh among the many schools I'll, I'll mention three of them and then we'll speak of the catechetical school there was the museum as it was called not as we would think of a museum today but a, a museum as a place of study founded by the scientist Ptolemy, was the most famous school in the East. In addition to the museum, there was the Serapion and the Sebastian. Each one of these schools had its own library. Uh, the library of the first and most famous school, the museum, had over 700,000 volumes, which in the ancient world is a, is a huge number. And the other schools likewise. So those great libraries of Alexandria that that in in the fifth century were destroyed, and and with that destruction came the loss of so many of the texts that that are central to the beginning of the Christian era were lost in in that fire of the great library of Alexandria. Many of the manuscripts, for example, of the Old Testament. Now, in, in the city of Alexandria, which was a great a Greek-speaking city, uh, in contrast to the rest of the land of Egypt, where, of course, uh, if you look at the map of Egypt, you, you see immediately that Egypt is mostly a desert. What gives life to Egypt is water, the Nile River, the Great River. And that's where most of the population then and now live. 
but the people who lived along the Nile were not primarily Greek speakers. They may have had some Greek as a second language, but they spoke the ancient language of Egypt, which is Coptic. So you have two cultures, the rural Coptic culture and the urban Alexandrian Hellenistic or Greek culture. So in the case of the city of Alexandria, we're talking about a Greek speaking city and a city that stood in the philosophical tradition of the, the great Greek philosophers. Now, Christianity came to Egypt in the first century, according to tradition. St. Jerome, for example, speaks of it. And uh, his account says that, uh, and as the church tradition proclaims until the present, that Christianity was brought to Egypt by the apostle Mark, Mark the Evangelist. And uh, Mark the Evangelist himself is a fascinating figure because Mark begins as a, a, a disciple of the Apostle Paul. Now, he had also been a disciple of, of the Lord, but he was not in the, in the group of 12 apostles. Some speculate that the Apostle Mark was the same uh, in, in gave a kind of signature, his own signature to his gospel by describing when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, there was a young man there. The gospel says it's only in the gospel of Mark do you find this. There was a young man who, who was who was watching. He was clothed, he was uh, clothed only in a one one linen garment and they grabbed him. And he ran, leaving his garment behind. And some have, have been of the opinion that that is Mark speaking of himself. Likewise, it's Mark's mother who had a house in Jerusalem. And in that house was the upper room where the Last Supper, as we call it, occurred. Also where, where the risen Lord appeared to, his, to, to the apostles on the day of the resurrection. Also where the Holy Spirit descended upon them at Pentecost. So... Mark, or John Mark, as he is called, is a central figure in the early church. But he started going around with St. Paul in St. Paul's missionary journeys, but we're told that in the middle of the first journey, he went back home. And when the time came for Paul's second journey, Mark wanted to go again. Paul wouldn't let him because he, he'd given up uh, because of the demands of the journey the first time around. So... Paul and Barnabas, who were cousins, uh, went off on their own. Now, Paul and, and Mark were reconciled later on before, before Mark died, but there was a, a division between them. So Mark went from Paul to being with Barnabas to being with Peter in Rome. And while Mark was, in, was with Peter in Rome, he wrote his gospel, and, and the early sources say that he did that as the secretary, as it were, of St. Peter, so that the second gospel, the gospel of Mark, is really the gospel of St. Peter. Then after Peter was crucified, Mark went to Egypt, to Alexandria, and became, according to tradition, the first bishop of Alexandria. And so that's how Egyptian Christianity begins. Now, within that Egyptian Christian world, centered on the city of Alexandria, there begins this school, begins in the second century. Some traditionally even call St. Mark the founder of that school, but that, that is uh, more a case of naming it in his honor. We hear more specific things about it in the second century and then in the third century when it's in its glory, as it were. So this school called the Didascalium, so the, the, place, of, the place of teaching, and you can't you can't picture here, you know, some sort of imposing looking structure uh, or anything like that, because 
Christians could not do anything publicly during the second or third centuries, either worship or, or study the scriptures, have a school. All of this would have been done in private homes. This is the period of the house churches. So in this school, the catechetical school, as it's called, we have, first of all, we, we are familiar with that word, catechesis, which of course comes from the Greek words to, to hear, to be instructed, to be listening, to be a, a listener, a hearer of the faith. So at this school, uh, everyone was welcome. Uh, believers, unbelievers, those who were baptized, those who were unbaptized. It was, on the one hand, a place to learn the basic Christian teachings, but also, on the other hand, a place to study the teachings of the faith in a deep way that was very much influenced by Greek philosophy. So the Catechetical School of Alexandria is the first attempt that we know of to have a Christian school that did not alienate itself from the classical wisdom of the Greek philosophers. So the, the great figures, there's, there's a number of, of uh, very, uh, very important names, it's, and, and I think probably many of you will, will recognize some of them. Uh, after Mark, who is traditionally described as beginning this school, uh, in the year 176, we have the name of Athenagoras, who is actually the first head of the school, and Athenagoras is followed by Pontanus. Now, Pontanus is an interesting figure because he is the instructor of the two uh, big names associated with the School of Alexandria. And, and these are, of course, Cl Clement, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen. So it's in it's in the second into the third century that this school reaches the height of of its influence. But this this early figure Pontanus is a fascinating a fascinating figure because he's he is referred to in the early histories of the church. Uh, Eusebius in the fourth century, Eusebius of Caesarea's history of the church speaks of Pontanus as being the teacher in the catechetical school there in Alexandria, and Pontanus also went on a journey to the east, where he visited as far, he went as far as india now now india uh in in the first in the second century ad was not quite the same as india on the modern map is now the indies meant to the east past past the tigris and euphrates but how, how far exactly pontanus went we're not exactly sure but pontanus claims that he went to those places where the apostles uh, Thomas and Bartholomew had evangelized the people. So that would include parts of, of present-day India and Armenia. And there, Pontanus is described, and this is very interesting, as reading, seeing copies of the Gospel of Matthew written in the original language. Now, in this case, now we, we think of the New Testament of being written entirely in Greek, and of course, all our manuscripts of the New Testament are written entirely in Greek. But by the original language in this case, Pontanus was claiming to, to see the Gospel of Matthew written either in Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, it's not clear which which one is is meant, but it's one of those two languages. And so he saw things of which there is no trace left. You know, we don't have any such manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew or Aramaic uh, dating from from the second or third centuries. You know, the oldest 
codices, as they are called, of the New Testament, complete, come from the fourth century, Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and, and the others. So before that time, there are many fragments of the New Testament, but there's not a complete manuscript. Likewise, for the Old Testament, it was in Alexandria in the second century before Christ that because of the large Jewish community there, that's another point to bring up about Alexandria, there is a huge Jewish community there, more Jews there than lived in Jerusalem. So when the temple was, had been destroyed six centuries previous by Nebuchadnezzar, the Jews were scattered. It's called the diaspora, the scattering of the Jews. Some were taken captive to Babylon. Some went to Egypt. It's, kind, it's a kind of, uh, in, in, in a sense, a, a sad description that, that those who had been set free by God uh, from Egypt in the Exodus go back there, but that's what many of them do. And they settle in the city of Alexandria, and they become Greek-speaking uh, by the time of even two centuries before Christ. Uh, more and more Jews have less and less familiarity with Hebrew. So Hebrew becomes a liturgical language used in the temple. But outside of Palestine, most of the Jews pray and read in Greek. And so there's the desire to translate the scriptures, the law and the prophets and the Psalms uh, into Greek. And that's what happens. Uh, the tradition of the 72 translators that give us what is called the Septuagint, the Greek text of the Old, of the Old Testament, as we call it, that remains the definitive uh, text of the church, the, uh, of the Old Testament. And so uh, now the, the fascinating thing about this is, of course, they would have translated the Old Testament from Hebrew manuscripts, but the Hebrew manuscripts that they used are, have been lost. But we don't have any, and any even bits of them. So the Alexandria is, is therefore the, the center of so much, not only, not only for Christianity, uh, dating from the first century, the apostolic age, but also the very large Jewish community there. And in that Jewish community, there, wa there were a number of, of important figures. Perhaps the one that is most referred to is Philo, P-H-I-L-O. And Philo, in his interpretation of the scripture, did something that was going to be very, uh, very central for the Christian teachers of the catechetical school, because Philo began to interpret the scriptures, uh, as we would say, allegorically. What does that mean? It means that for Greek-speaking Jews, and especially for non-Jews who were being increasingly drawn to the teaching of the one God. So uh, you'll remember from, from your familiarity with the New Testament, when, for example, in the Acts of the Apostles, when St. Paul and those with him are going around and preaching, the first thing they do when they go to a new place is they go to the Jewish synagogue. And they, they preach to the Jewish people, but they also preach to those who are referred very frequently as the God-fearers, those who feared God. That expression is used over and over again in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. The Jews and those who feared God. Who are they, the God-fearers? They are Gentiles. They are Gentiles who kind of hang around the synagogue, <laughs> we might say, because they are drawn to the teaching of the one God. They are not drawn to convert to Judaism. They are not interested in all of the 613 laws, precepts, statutes, and ordinances of Moses. They're not interested in keeping the, the dietary laws. The, they are not interested in having their males circumcised. They're not interested in the whole uh, ceremonial 
uh, content of so much of the law of Moses. And they're not interested in being, in segregating themselves from the rest of society, which of course is what, what observant Jews had to do. You know, observant Jews could not eat with Gentiles. The very strict observant Jews, the Pharisees, for example, uh, were so were were so extreme in, concerning contact with Gentiles that if if they were out in the in the streets and even the shadow of a Gentile crossed their path, they would go home and and wash themselves. So that's how, that's how you know the scripture speaks of the of the wall the wall between Jew and Gentile. In, in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a wall between the court of the Gentiles. Herod had, had enlarged the temple in Jerusalem. And in the court of the Gentiles, they were allowed to come. Jesus did a good bit of his teaching there. But between the court of the Gentiles and the court of Israel, there was a wall and every few feet there was posted, not even by the Jews, but by the Roman government, that any Gentile who passed who passed up beyond that wall it was a capital crime. So even the Romans enforced the separation of the Jews, which which the Jews insisted. Now that's that's of course one of the central issues of of the first centuries of the church. Because, of course, on the one hand, that separation was commanded by God. And it was for a purpose. It was so that the people that he had chosen, the children of Abraham, would be set aside as those who would, who would be the ones from whom the Savior would be born. But that separation had become an end in itself. And so people hung on to the separation for the sake of being separate. They forgot, perhaps, that God had said to Abraham that, that in his seed, everybody on earth was going to be blessed. They forgot that, that Israel was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah as a light to all the Gentiles. So this whole issue of Jews and Gentiles comes to a uh, unique kind of ferment boiling up in, in the city of Alexandria. And the Jewish teachers in Alexandria realized that, and I think as many of us realize now, how often do you or people you know uh, say things like, I really find it hard to read a lot of the Old Testament. There's, it's all this, all this uh, business of, of wars and and Israel occupying the promised land and the and all, all of the details of the observance of the Mosaic law, and, and many people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to learn from that now. And that was that's not only true in in recent times, but it's also true in the ancient world. That the many Jewish teachers themselves, of whom Philo of Alexandria was a, a, a the most prominent, realized that one had to present the scriptures not simply in their historical or literal sense. That there was there was that sense, of course, but in addition to that, there was a spiritual sense of the scriptures. And later on, the church fathers are going to elaborate that spiritual sense and saying that yes, of course. Uh, and again, I know that many of you have, have heard me say such things as this in in other other classes that that the ICC has presented, but. Our Lord himself, for example, used a spiritual sense of interpreting the scriptures. Our Lord Jesus, for example, said that the scriptures were all about him. He said everything in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms are, is about me. It's quite a claim to make, you know. Either you accept that claim or you don't. Uh, now, 
and, and and so for example our lord would quote the psalms and and he and he would say well uh, now here i am i am interpreting the words of the lord in the gospel but i think i'm doing so accurately and and, and in accord with the tradition of the church our lord would say well Yes, David had a son Solomon, and the psalm that Jesus quoted most uh, is about da is about David and Solomon historically. But really, Jesus says it's about me and the Father. So that is a that is a spiritual or typological, as it is called, meaning that the people and events described in the Old Testament point to a story that's going to have its end further on. So. That spiritual un, un, interpretation of the scriptures, either in terms of types like Abraham and Isaac and the crossing of the Red Sea and the Passover lamb and so forth, that point to something beyond themselves, to Christ, <clears throat> or <clears throat> the moral sense of scripture in which uh, people are taught to look for a life lesson, we, we would say. In what is read, how does this how does this apply to living a righteous life, a good life, a life in accordance with the commandments of God? And then the the final sense or the ultimate sense, which is a, a fancy word is used to describe that, the anagogical sense from anagogi in Greek to go up, the eternal sense of Scripture, the the sense from not in time, but but in, in eternity, from the eternal sight of God. So there's <clears throat> many different levels of scriptural interpretation. And that's what the great teachers of the catechetical school of Alexandria are known for, uh, Clement and Origen. Now, let's say something about uh, each of those. Clement, now it's interesting that um, in, the, in the church tradition, Clement of Alexandria is called a saint by some. So in the Roman tradition, he's referred to as Saint Clement of Alexandria, in the Coptic tradition, likewise. In the Byzantine tradition, he's simply called Clement of Alexandria. It's not, not to, uh, to uh, disagree that, that, he, that he was a holy man, but uh, he's he is there's no he doesn't have a place in the liturgical calendar so it's a uh, and then of course the greatest figure on the one hand it's it's a paradox here the greatest figure of this catechetical school uh, the great Origen uh, on the one hand though he influenced the great majority of all the fathers of the church were taught by him either directly or indirectly on the one hand. But on the other hand, he was he was uh, a voluminous writer, rather like Augustine in the West. He really wrote a lot. And as people read his, even after he died, and, and Origen, he's a third century figure now, comes after Clement. Uh, Origen <clears throat> was the son of a martyr. His father's name was Leonidas. So you have to remember that this school of Alexandria takes place while Christians are suffering and dying for the faith. So it's not it's not something you you know some sort of uh, la di da exercise of, of people who have a lot of, of free time. <laughs> Let's have a school. Uh, rather, it was the Christians who were under persecution who formed that school, and Origen. Uh, was was so he was a teenager when his father was taken away uh, and, and and died for the faith would uh, would would not renounce his Christian faith and uh, Origen's mother was so fr was afraid that she, she was she was grateful that that her husband uh, gave his life for Christ but she saw that Origen was about to go after him when when they took him away so she locked up all his clothes. So he couldn't go out. So he, he's the son of a martyr. And he he died not exactly a martyr, but as a confessor. He, he was arrested. In, and this was in Caesarea in Palestine. He was arrested and tortured in prison 
so severely that even though he didn't die at the time, he died later on as a result of the treatment that he had received, tortured for Christ's sake. And he said in his own words that he died a faithful son of the church. Uh, and, you know, you, th those are his last words. And in fact, he, he did die in, in the full communion of the church. But there is a very uh, uh, kind of unresolvable uh, contradiction about him because 300 years after Origen died, so Origen died in the 250s, 300 years, so in the 6th century, at one of the ecumenical councils of the church, the 5th ecumenical council, Origen was condemned as a heretic. And some might debate, and I, you know, I would say it's a debatable point. I would say so. Uh, some, would de some might debate whether you can excommunicate somebody who actually died in the communion of the church 300 years after he died. But the reason why that was done, and it was very serious, is that the more people read the teachings of Origen, the more they realized that it was a it was his attempt, and he was a genius, a genius, and and a and an ascetic, you know, one one who who lived a life of renunciation. In fact, uh, he was accused by some, and and the consensus is that the, that the accusation is accurate, of of uh, mutilating himself, castrating himself. His bishop in Alexandria. Uh, refused, according to the account, to ordain him because of that. He did it as, uh, that's what happens sometimes, for example, remember what our Lord says in the gospel about your foot or, and your hand and your eye. If your foot or hand or eye lead you to sin, Jesus says, cut it off and throw it away. Better to enter into life with one hand or, or maimed or lame or, or half blind than have than to having all of, all of your senses to be cast into Gehenna. Jesus says that in the gospel. Of course, one has to see that in its context. It is using hyperbole, which Jesus uses very often. It's a kind of exaggeration to make a point. Jesus is not suggesting that we start taking the hatchet to various parts of our bodies. But Origen, in his, in his young manhood, took some of those things very seriously. So he was an ascetic and a genius. And also trained in the philosophy of Plato. And so his theology, on the one hand, even though he is really the father of, of biblical study in the church, and he is the one that, that develops and even perfects this multi-leveled uh, senses of, of interpreting the scripture, not just, not just literally, but spiritually, uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, he, and he's not alone in doing this, but he, he is the one that that is most renowned for it, he makes, he attempts to make a marriage between uh, Platonic philosophy and Christian faith. And that led him into trouble. Now, on the one hand, when Origen taught, and he, and he taught in the catechetical school, so he taught the catechumens, when he taught the faith in, in his school, he was very orthodox. But when he wrote and engaged in speculation, he could be pretty, pretty wild sometimes. So, for example, I'll give you I'll give you examples. And the, and the reason why this is relevant to our time is that we we speak of now, you know, to, to what extent. Can we as Christians use the wisdom of this world? To what extent can we as Christians use science? Alexandria was the city of science. Uh, 
And of course, the answer to that is we can use anything that is good and true. What is good is good. What is true is true. However, we can't use the product of human reason to be the ultimate criterion of truth and end up denying the revelation of God. So we have in the Catechetical School of Alexandria, uh, in one way with Clement and another way with Origen, Clement uh, is, is, is more dependent actually on, on Greek philosophy than Origen is. But on the other hand, Origen, when he does use the philosophy of Plato, you know, Plato, for example, describes the human person as a soul imprisoned in a body. So obviously, if the body is the prison of the soul, then, then our, our destiny, according to Plato, is to have that soul released from its prison, and then who cares about the prison anymore? Discard the body. It's no, of no further use. Throw it out. It's trash. So when you have a kind of view of life that is focused on this, this very strict division between soul and body, it's very easy to go to the extreme of speaking of material things as bad. Now, did Origen do that? He didn't. There were others doing that. And they were doing it in Alexandria and other places. They are called the Gnostics. The Gnostics, Gnosticism, is based on a philosophical view that is called dualism. And dualism teaches that what is good is spiritual and the material, therefore, is bad. And many of the Gnostics also taught that the human soul pre-exists the body. So when a human being comes into existence, that means that a a soul, a spiritual soul that already existed is imprisoned in this body. And therefore, many of these Gnostic groups said, marriage isn't good. Uh, those of you who have read your New Testaments well will, will recognize that St. Paul already and St. John are, are having to deal with those who, who say that marriage is a bad thing. Or or they're saying that there is no there is no real resurrection of the body. The Gnostics would would take some of the teachings of Jesus and twist them and say that well the real resurrection is inside you. It's 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 in your mind. It's in your soul. But there's no real resurrection of the body. Saint Paul writes about those who are teaching that the resurrection is already past. Well, Origen didn't do that. He was against the Gnostics, and he, he believed and, and insisted that he did. He believed the doctrines of the creed, but he had his own spin on things. And, uh, and then, so some sp specific illustrations of that. One of Origen's favorite verses from the New Testament was 1 Corinthians 15, 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. I'll read that to you. Because uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is, of course, Paul's great, it's one of the climaxes of the New Testament. It's the great chapter on the resurrection. In, where St. Paul says, if, if, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our faith is empty. But in the middle of that chapter, so 1 Corinthians 15, 28, St. Paul says this. He says, when all things are subjected to the Son, so St. Paul is talking about what will happen at the end. At the end, all things will be under the authority of the Son. Then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, 
namely the Father, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That God may be all in all. Now, when Origen interpreted those words of St. Paul, he said that that means that ultimately everyone and everything will be saved. So Origen taught what is called universalism, the salvation of everyone, everything, including the evil spirits, including the devil, including the damned. So you might ask, well, how does Origen explain away all the things that are said about hell? And by the way, the the person who speaks most about hell in the, in the entire Bible, Old and New Testaments, is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He talks more about hell than anybody. So how do you, how do you explain that? And Origen would say, well, he said he would say it is so, because he, he believed in, in the words of Jesus, but he said that is for the time that precedes everything being subject to him and him being subject to the Father, then after that, Origen said in his speculations, that God will be all in all and everyone and everything will be saved. And or Origen didn't stop there. He said that, now, here you have, uh, this is kind of an archetype, a model of a conflict. In the Bible, in the scriptures, time and history is linear. Goes from point A to point B. In Greek philosophy, time is cyclical. Not just in Greek philosophy, for example, if you know anything about Indian philosophy and Hinduism, the same thing there. It's the wheel that goes around and around and around. And that's why there are. That's why in in uh, not only not only Indian but also Greek of the understanding of of human persons that you have many lifetimes, many incarnations. The wheel goes around and around and around. That's by the way not considered a blessing. <laughs> uh, but Origen had so he was there was a conflict in Origen. Because he knew, of course, that the scriptural revelation uh, presents time as the creation of God. It has a beginning. It has an end. It's not something that always was. Only God always is. And God is outside of time. God enters time in the incarnation, but God himself lives outside of time. Now, Origen said that after, again, quoting his favorite verse, after God is all in all and everybody is saved, then, sooner or later, another cycle will start. And it'll, it'll happen all over again in another sort of way. The, so Origen could not get out of the cyclical understanding of time. Now, because of that, because of things like that, even though he was so wise in his interpretation of Scripture, the church uh, dealt really very harshly with him. And actually, the East dealt more harshly with him than the West did. The West, for example, uh, those of you who pray the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, you, you you will in the office of readings, for example, there are still passages from Origen that that are read. But in the East, it's forbidden to use the, any writings of Origen in the church services. Priests are not allowed to quote them. I I cannot say if I'm preaching a homily as as Origen taught and read so and so. I'm not allowed to do that. Now you can sort of do it indirectly because, uh, but you can't you you can't do it directly. But so many of the great fathers, you know, uh, Basil and Gregory the Theologian, and and so many others, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, the Cappadocian fathers, and also the fathers in the West, 
were influenced by him. So the catechetical school now, and, and all that we have, all that we really could do this evening is this basic introduction. Uh, what happened to it after, after the third century? Well, after the third century, of course, the persecutions ended the beginning of the fourth century. And some of the later figures of the school were the were bishops of, of Alexandria, Dionysius of Alexandria, and Peter of Alexandria. Peter of Alexandria was, was one of the last martyrs before the Roman persecutions ended. So it stopped existing pretty much in the fourth century. By the time of Athanasius, for example, now, now the Alexandrian tradition. Uh, continues with Athanasius, the great Athanasius, who, who defended the divinity of the Son of God against Arius. Now, why, why was it that the worst of heretics, at least as far as the, our tradition is concerned, the worst of heretics is Arius? And where does he come from? He comes from Alexandria. And he also is trapped inside a, a paradox that that he that leads him into teaching false doctrine. He cannot resolve in his mind, Arius this is, that Jesus on the one hand says, the Father is greater than I. And then on the other hand, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. I and the Father are one. So instead of realizing that this is an expression of both and, because there is a sense in which the Father, as the origin, not origin, but origin, <laughs> the Father as the origin of the Son, and the Father is the origin of the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not a beginning in time because they're not creatures. Uh, they are they are divine persons, but they are not independent gods. We are not, as I know many of you have heard me say many times, we are not tritheists. Father, Son, and Spirit are not independent gods. They are interdependent persons, interdependent. And the Son is the Son of the Father. And the Spirit, as, as the the original text of the creed says, which the Eastern churches still insist on using the original text, the son is begotten of the father, the spirit proceeds from the father. So the father is, to use the Greek word, the archi, he is the source, the source. So on the, on the one hand, because the son is begotten by the father, the father does have that first place that first place, that first greatness. But that does not mean that the Son and the Spirit are not divine. So you can say both. It's always both and, not either or. You, you can and must say, if you're going to be a, a, you know, a, a Nicene Christian, one who accepts the Nicene Creed, you have to say that the Son and the Spirit and the Father are one, yet the Son and the Spirit and the Father are also distinct, but not distinct in an independent sense. So the Father is the greatest, but that does not deprive the Son and the Spirit of their equality with him. Now, Arius could not, could, could not resolve that. So Arius was, a both, was an either-or man, and he took the path that treated the, the Son of God as a creature. And, and, where, and where is this happening? It's happening in the Church of Alexandria. And again, it comes from too much rationalism. So the danger, so that's, I guess, the point that I, I wish to leave with you in this, in this presentation, as brief as it was, the danger of this unique Christian school, it gave many great gifts to the church, especially in, in scriptural interpretation, 
especially in making a distinction between what is what is good from classical philosophy and you know the church accepted that the church uh the church does uh even even in iconographic art you can see examples of this especially in europe if you go into the narthexes of many of the ancient churches that have ancient mosaics, the narthex, of course, is the, the entryways, not the inside of the church, not the nave, not the sanctuary. But in the narthex, you will, you will see icon-like mosaics of, of Plato and Socrates, Aristotle, and some of the others. And this is to show, and this is Clement of Alexandria would say this, that they, in their way, prepared the way for the truth of the gospel. So God directly revealed himself to the people of Israel. And he did this through the law and the prophets. But that does not mean that he had completely abandoned everyone else. So, uh, for example, St. Paul in Acts 17, Acts of the Apostles, when he preached to the Greeks in Athens on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, he quotes the Greek philosophers. He says, as some of your own philosophers have said. And then in the letter to the Romans, St. Paul says that, that the truth of God is can be found even to those who have not received divine revelation, if, if they grope for God, he uses the word grope, to feel for God, they will find him, he says. So the, the catechetical school of Alexandria gave that place to uh, classical philosophy that the church, both in the East and West, continues to do. That's why... Uh, Traditionally, someone being prepared for ordination studies both philosophy and theology. St. Clements, uh, back to him just for a bit before I close, he, he wrote three, three books. One was the Exhortation to the Greeks. The second one was called the uh, Pedagogue, Pedagogos, you know, the, the schoolmaster. And then the other was, he calls the miscellanies, the mis miscellaneous things. But in, in those works, he says that the purpose of philosophy was to bring people from polytheistic paganism to groping for the one God so that they would be prepared to receive the fullness of revelation in Christ. So Christ is the end uh, directly the, the end of the law and the prophets, they, for, they foretell him and prepare his way, but he's also the fulfillment of everything that is good and true in philosophy. So that's the, that's the treasure of, of Clement and Origen and those with, with them in the school of Alexandria. And it's, it's a uh, model for not only that time, but for ours, that yes, we can make use of the products of human reason. And yes, we should, because they are they are the evidence of our, our being created in the image and, and likeness of God, the intellect, the proper use of the intellect. But the intellect, if it is to find God, and that and that is our that is our destiny to find God and to live in God, it must submit obediently to the revelation of God. So there is this marriage of truth and reason, you know, fides et ratio in Latin. So that's what the that's what the catechetical, catechetical school of Alexandria sought in its great teachers, with with sometimes success, sometimes less so. And that shouldn't surprise us. And we should, you know, we we should uh, be grateful for the successes and 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 still, of course, uh, be willing to be formed and taught by, by the, you could say that in the School of Alexandria, theology, the study of theology is born there in a unique way. So, uh, and, and we can certainly, even though we would not, we would not accept the erroneous aspects of Origen's teaching, nevertheless, we can still uh, 
take the the best expressions of of that school as as a way to to more richly partake of what has been revealed to us and not not only in the scriptures but in the self revelation of God himself through the incarnation of the lord so i'll i'll stop there wonderful thank you so much father what a what a treasure for us this evening and teaching us so much about the origin as well as origin um, <laughs> in that school of alexandria for us tonight Father David, we'll go ahead and do some question and answer sure. as we finish out this evening together. So many coming in this evening and asking a lot of questions um, regarding origin and Plato um, and, and kind of what the school did um, for that time. So we'll start with a question coming in from Martha regarding origin and Plato, um, asking, isn't there a resemblance between Plato's theory of forms and St. Paul's observation that we must now see through glass darkly, but then face to face? And she's asking, why is it dangerous to see, or is it dangerous to see some of that Christianity in Plato? Well, and of course, the, uh, behind this question, uh, which uh, there's there's uh, a similar question, and it's been it's been endlessly discussed the the word that we are so used to for example in in saint john's gospel the logos the logos the word uh john speaking of of the, of the eternal word of the father well this is also an expression that was used not in the not in an identical sense but uh, in the philosophers also there is there there is in Platonic philosophy there is the the logos and so we have to see the context of of each of these. Now, the the forms as as Plato describes them are the absolute sources of the things that we see. So uh, we see things according to the senses. You know, Plato, Plato just uh, taught essentially that there are four kinds of knowledge. So there's there's the knowledge that comes through the senses. So our senses see and hear and smell and touch and taste. Then from and you can see here almost the beginning of the scientific method from what the senses perceive, then the mind, the intellect, uh, digests that sense information and comes up with conclusions or facts, we would say. But but now, now of course, someone who is a materialist would say, well, that's all there is to knowledge. There's just uh, sense information and and reasonable conclu reason reasoned conclusions drawn from that. But Plato didn't believe that. Plato taught there's two more kinds of knowledge. The the third is intuition, in which in which even though the mind and the senses might be involved in this, intuition is not deductive. It's direct it's a direct perception that comes from uh, the, the way in which the human creature is is able to perceive so so uh, you know it, we hear people say and I'm, I'm sure all of us have said it uh concerning this or that i just know this even though i can't i can't prove it in in a uh, sense perception to reason progression. Now, either you accept that there is such a knowledge as that, or you don't. If you don't, you're a materialist. And, and, and that's what, of course, not science, but scientism is based on. Uh, scientism is a, is a absolutizing of the senses and, and the reason, drawing conclusions from the senses and saying that's all there is. But Plato allowed also for intuition and also revelation. So if intuition comes directly from the inside, revelation comes directly from the outside. So what comes from what comes from the outside is that we we living in time, living in in matter, 
see things now the 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 inquirers uh, the, 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 who asked this question says quote saint paul first corinthians 13 now we see through a glass dimly then we shall see face to face so there you might say that there is a certain uh similarity on the one hand on the other hand though this and this i think is the heart of the matter uh it's the face to face that in Christ, God has made himself known in a way that cannot prepare, cannot be compared to anything else. So that's, to put it in the context of our talk tonight, that, that was the tension, we could, you could say, in, in the Alexandrian school. So the Alexandrian school was fascinated with ideas just as Plato was fascinated with forms. But in Christ, those ideas have a face. Then we so we don't we don't stop at ideas. Ideas are to lead us on to persons, divine persons, human persons, divine persons in perfect and eternal communion who create human persons to share that that uh, communion. Plotinus, who, who uh, there's uh, uh, Neoplatonism comes from, uh, Plotinus is one of the great teachers of Neoplatonism, he speaks of this ascent to the one. And that's, that's all fine and noble in its way, the idea of ascent to the one. But in Christ, of course, comes the reality of the joining in communion of created persons with uncreated persons. So people become partakers of, of the divine nature, as St. Peter said, not, not simply by a, an interchange of ideas, but by actual a, a personal communion. So that is what I think is the distinction there between, between Paul and Plato, if, right. that, if that makes sense. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you, Father. Um, we have another question in coming in from Bradley talking about this three different types of interpretation that you talked to us about this evening, one with the types, two with the moral sense, and three with the interpretation in eternity instead of time. Mm -hmm. And asking in those, was this the first time that all of those ideas had come together with those three different interpretations? Um, or had people heard them separately, kind of a little bit of insight on those interpretations? Okay. The first step in, in these various interpretations of scriptures what, what, what comes uh, actually before Origen, comes from, from Philo of Alexandria. And it's, it's the, the uh, literal as contrasted to the, the spiritual or sometimes mystical meaning. So there's two, initially two senses, the, the literal and spiritual or mystical. Then the spiritual and mystical is later on, especially with the influence of St. Augustine, further um, differentiated into three different expressions. One is the one is the typological or the allegorical. So sometimes these these two are used interchangeably. There's a distinction that is made between them, but I'd maybe better pass that by at least this evening, uh, in which persons and events, though real in themselves, find their meaning in what they foreshadow. They point forward. That's typology. They are types of what is to come. And then also the, the, sen the moral sense is that in the examples of, of the great figures of Scripture, the, speaking here of the Law and the Prophets, the Old Testament, that is a foreshadowing of Christ in the fullness as the way, truth, and life but learning the righteous life, which by the way, uh, of course, the scripture insists we are capable of doing because we don't believe in total depravity. There's lots of people in the scriptures who are spoken of as living righteous before the Lord. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth and, and Simeon and Anna, for example. And of course, of course, the parents of Our Lady and Our Lady herself. So, although she is a, she is a, a particular figure, of course, Our Lady. So, the, so the, then the, the ultimate sense that the, to use the Latin expression, subspecie eternitatis, from the viewpoint of eternity, uh, sees the scripture from the viewpoint of when all is fulfilled. And I think, I, I, I forget, I think it might have been Father Benedict Rochelle who, who used this example. And I think it's a very good one. Um, in the, in, in Dachau concentration camp, where, where there were lots of Christian clergy imprisoned and executed there. All the, all the prisoners there would pray together as much as they could. They would pray especially every evening, uh, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, or, or because the, it was mostly Christians there, Catholic, Protestants, or, or Orthodox. And, the, and the, before they ended the day, they would pray the 45th Psalm. And the 45th Psalm says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be shaken and the mountains are hurled into the depths of the sea. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our shelter. Come behold the works of the Lord. He has crushed the bow and shattered the, the spear and burnt the weapons with fire. So it speaks of the victory of God. Well, they're praying this every night when, when what, is, what is present looks like the uh, uh, complete opposite of the victory of God. It looks like the, the triumph of the Nazis. But they prayed it from the viewpoint of eternity. And God is victorious. God is victorious now. That's the point of the ultimate sense. So these these three the three the three subdivisions if if you like of the spiritual sense the the typological the moral and the final or energetical or ultimate they work together to take one beyond a a basic historical understanding and and that's that's not to say that it's not good to learn the basic historical understanding of scripture the literal sense as far as we can but there are some things about the literal sense that we don't know from historical context. So, the, therefore, the spiritual sense, the fathers of the church, and this is where the Alexandrian school is, is foundational, fathers of the church uh, present as being of, of even greater significance than the, than the historical sense. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father. I think God is victorious in, in the time of persecution. What a what a great closing point for us this evening. Father, thank you so much for, for being with us and for giving us such great insight into the school at Alexandria and really uh, the greatness that, that helped the church there. Um, if you could please close us in prayer this evening. Yes. Uh, the Father is our hope. The Son is our refuge. The Holy Spirit is our protector. All Holy Trinity, glory be to you. Beneath your protection, we take refuge. Holy Virgin Theotokos, do not despise our supplications in our necessities, but deliver us from harm, O ever glorious and blessed Virgin. By the way, before I conclude, that prayer that I've just said to the Mother of God is the, is the oldest written prayer outside the Hail Mary in the Gospel, the oldest written prayer, and, and it's where it is found first is in Egypt. So it comes from the Church of Egypt. God is with us through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.